Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinker Series proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. With the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Evelyn Gates, Executive Director and CEO of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. She did her PhD right here at Case Western Reserve University and then did postdoctoral work at Yale University and the University of Chicago. She spent time at the Adler Planetarium, eventually becoming the Vice President for Science and Education, and then at the Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics of the University of Chicago, where she was Associate Assistant Director. In 2010, she came to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. She has written books and many published papers. Her first book, Einstein's Telescope, The Hunt for Dark Matter and Dark Energy of the Universe, was published in February 2009. So it's a pleasure to welcome her here tonight to speak to us about Einstein's telescope. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Evelyn Gates. Thank you, Glenn. I'm sure many of you know that this is the perfect time to talk about general relativity and Einstein's telescope, which comes from it, because this is the 100th anniversary of his theory. It was published, I'm not going to forget the exact date, but within the next few days, 100 years ago, that he published this theory that radically changed our understanding of the universe, what it is, what it's, what it's made of, and where we fit into the picture. So this is a theory you often come up with, scientists will come up with something new. It takes us a step further in our understanding of something. This didn't take us a step further. This took us into an entirely new universe. It changed our basic understanding of space and time and our place in the cosmos. And so when we look out at the universe today, when Einstein looked out at the universe, and I, I just want to spend a minute on this before we get into gravitational lensing, he saw what he and everyone else assumed was a more or less static universe. The universe was. It just was. It always has been. And what he was trying to understand was how things within it worked. And he went to create this theory. And I think this is one of the only equations that I'm going to show tonight. But I just had to put them up because aren't they beautiful? <laughs> OK. Um, and I say they. That's a shorthand way of writing 10 different equations. But what it, it, it says in the simplest way is that on the far side, that's describing space and time, what space looks like, what its architecture is. And on the closer side to me, that's matter and energy in the universe. And it's saying that the way space is shaped, how it moves, what's happening in space depends on what's in it, the matter and energy in it. And the matter, matter and energy within the universe, how they move around, is shaped by the stuff that's within it. So matter and energy shape space, which in turn dictate how matter and energy move around. It's really very simple, right? <laughs> And so when you look out at the universe, this is one of my favorite images. This is the new Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which includes now ultraviolet uh, wavelengths as well. It's just stunning. That's a tiny, tiny patch of the sky that to Einstein and any telescope he had at the time would have just been dark. And through new technology, it's, it's come to life almost like looking through a microscope for the first time in a, in a drop of water and seeing all the little things swimming around in it, which maybe I shouldn't say because we're going to have dinner later. OK. <laughs> But as you're looking out at this, one of the things that Einstein was trying to understand, how does the universe work? What does it look like? How does gravity work within it? And by the time he got done with his theory, it wasn't what does the universe look like? It's what is the structure of space time? So we think of space as just being the backdrop. It's just there. There are things in space. And what his theory said was, no, space itself has an underlying architecture. It's a very active player in everything that goes on in the universe. It then introduced questions like, how old is the universe? Because to me, one of the most important things that Einstein brought was that the universe now had a time element. It wasn't just what it was. It has changed. It has a past. It has a future. It has evolved over time. And if you think about how radically that changes everything, when you look up at the stars and the sky just seems to be there and nothing is moving, and then you realize the universe itself is, is part of a, a, an evolutionary series. A, 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 it's, it's a very active thing, which means you begin to ask questions like, 
How old is the universe? Can we reconstruct its history and its evolution? What is the ultimate fate of the cosmos? Those were questions we didn't really even think to ask before Einstein's theory of relativity. And the answer to a lot of those questions depends on what the universe is made of. Because if you go back to Einstein's equation, that's basically saying how space itself moves and shapes, which is telling you something about its evolution in history, depends on what is in it, how much and what kind of stuff. And what we've learned recently is that this question has now been, been that the resolution has increased to where we now say, what is dark matter and what is dark energy? And I'm going to get into that a little bit more. But we now know that the universe, most of the universe is made of things that are very different than anything we have ever detected, anything we've ever created in a particle accelerator, anything that ever, any chemist has ever cooked up, different than stars, different than planets, different than people. And we know that most of the universe is dark. And by dark, it means it doesn't emit light, it doesn't reflect light, it doesn't interact with light. And if you think about how we see things, for the most part with our eyes or with our telescopes, you're detecting light. It's coming in and your ultraviolet light, x-ray light, all of this is light. And if something doesn't interact with light, how do we even know it's there? And it gets even more exciting. So not only is it dark, it's very likely that most of the matter in the universe is dark, some kind of exotic new particle that's very different than anything we've ever uh, seen, created, touched, and that most of the universe is not even a matter of any kind. It's in this strange stuff called dark energy that is taking over the control of the cosmos and its expansion rate and therefore its ultimate fate. So we've got, as we've answered some questions, we've got some really big ones out there. And this evidence for a dark universe, I'm not going to go into detail in this slide, but when I tell you something really radical, like most of the universe, 95% of the universe is in stuff that we've never seen or detected, it's invisible, we can't see it, that's a pretty big claim. And what I want to do with this slide, which is this is tracing the history of the universe from just after the Big Bang, over 13.7 billion years to the universe of galaxies we see around us today. And the really cool thing is, if this were a, a legal case, and we're trying to find you know, the, the who done it, basically we have evidence that's the equivalent of fingerprint evi uh, fingerprints, DNA, eyewitnesses. We've got everything except the culprit themselves. And we're looking at the universe today in all different kinds of light. We're looking at gravitational lensing that we're going to talk about. We've got computer simulations. We look at galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And as we look further and away in space, in cosmology, that means looking further back in time, the further away we look, we're seeing the primordial clouds of gas that um, coalesce to form stars and galaxies. We're looking back to the cosmic microwave background itself, the very first light that was emitted from the hot afterglow of the Big Bang that's traveled since the universe was less than 400,000 years old. We're looking at what we know about nuclear physics. And all of this evidence comes together to state very strongly that most of the universe is dark, that we're just, we're so far in the minority here, we're just a little afterthought sprinkled throughout the universe. We and everything that's made of atoms and molecules and quarks and electrons. And so this evidence is really, really strong. And what it says is this is the cosmic census. It is 5% normal matter. And most of that normal matter we can't see either because it's in faint clouds of gas that fill the universe. But all the stars you see, that Hubble Ultra Deep Field that I showed you that just had thousands and thousands of galaxies, that's less than 5% of everything that there is. Dark matter itself is almost a quarter of everything that is. And most of the universe is in this dark energy. So when we look out at a galaxy, what you're seeing here is about 10% of everything that's in that galaxy because what a galaxy mostly is, is dark matter, a giant sphere of dark matter that would stretch past the ends of this room. And this is like a jewel, kind of the jelly at the center of a very big jelly donut. And when we look out at the universe itself, this is looking at a, at a couple of clusters that you really almost can't even see in optical light. It just looks like an empty part in space. If we could see dark matter, and I'm going to show you a way that we can trace out the dark matter, our dark matter eyes would see this. The universe is filled with this dark matter. It's got a structure and an architecture to it that's absolutely stunningly beautiful, and we need to find it. So the question is, you can't see it. You can't detect it with any telescope, including our space telescopes. 
How are we going to look for the dark universe? It's 95% of everything that is. I'm going to stop for one little thing that I've also found fascinating. We think about dark matter. So if it's here, it's streaming right through this room, through us, through you, through the seats, you know, thousands and thousands of particles every second. So we think of ourselves as being, you know, dark matter is invisible to us. But actually, since we're the small component, we're the ghosts of the universe. We are invisible to what most of the universe is. It also doesn't see us, just goes streaming right on through it. It's kind of cool. The question is, how do we look for this stuff? And Einstein himself left us with an entirely new kind of telescope that we can use to probe. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history here before the first break, because I think it's kind of cool. And it talks about how cultural and, and uh, science interplay. So in 1912, Einstein was working on his theory of general relativity. He wanted to understand gravity. And he thought he had the answer. And so he went to Berlin, where he found he was a theorist. He probably would have hurt himself making that little wine glass that I did. But, but he, he um, went to, to a, a colleague, an astronomer, and said, I've got this great new theory. If you go out and make these observations, you're going to confirm my theory. We are both going to be famous forever. This is really great. He got his, the astronomer all uh, excited about this. Um, and the prediction, he said, is that the mass of the sun should deflect the light of a star coming from far behind it. You should be able to see this deflection of light because the sun has mass. It's going to warp space, warp time at the time, he thought. And it's going to make, make a gravitational lens, of course. Problem was, he hadn't quite finished his theory. And this is where Einstein himself couldn't get his mind totally around the fact that space and time are going to be warped by the presence of matter. Nonetheless, he sent his friend off and said, the only time you can actually detect this deflection is during a solar eclipse. You're looking for the light of a star very close to the sun. And the sun's light is going to drown the light of the star almost all the time unless there's a solar eclipse, when suddenly the stars that are directly behind the sun come into view. Now, solar eclipses happen maybe seven a decade or so. They're, they're reasonably common. But you can only see them from certain places on the Earth for each eclipse. So in August of 1914, Erwin Freundlich, his astronomer friend, set out to observe this upcoming solar eclipse, make this famous um, uh, observation from the best vantage point, which happened to be the Crimean Peninsula in Russia. Anybody know your history? He got there, he and his team got there just in time for the outbreak of World War I. The Russian army captured the astronomers confiscated all their equipment, and they never got to make the measurements, which actually was too bad for them. They were released about a month later. I don't think they ever got their stuff back again. But Einstein hadn't yet finished his equation. He was off by a critical factor of two. Had the measurements been made, they would not have agreed with the theory. And so Einstein's theory may have had a much rockier beginning, um, and it might eventually have still come um, to be accepted. But it's a little bit hard when you have a really big false step like that. Fast forward a few years, the end of the war, the solar eclipse uh, take two. Sir Arthur Eddington, whose name might be a little bit more familiar than Freundlich, did go and make the measurements. He was able to uh, make the observations that confirmed Einstein's theory. And the headlines that, that were released around the world the day after Einstein reported the results were revolution in science, new theory of the universe. And that's absolutely true. So from that point on, Einstein was synonymous with genius. There's another little war story I wanted to tell here at the same time. So back in November 2015, Karl Schwarzschild was on the Russian front. He was a German soldier. He was in his 40s, volunteered to go to the front. He was a physicist, a theorist, liked to do equations, and he was calculating missile trajectories. And while he's dodging bombs and bullets and other things, Einstein publishes his paper. He somehow gets a copy of this new theory of general relativity. And while he's at the Russian front, manages to write down the first equations describing what became later known as a black hole. He sent his, his calculations back to Einstein, who read them out loud at the Prussian Academy of Sciences, because uh, Schwarzschild couldn't be there. And uh, the Schwarzschild solution has been one of the cornerstones of general relativity since then. Unfortunately, he died at the front of an illness a few months later. So he never really got to see the, the results of what played out. So culture and science have ways of interacting that we don't always expect. Gravitational lensing. So what Einstein was talking about is the fact that this is the two-dimensional version of the universe. You've got a rubber sheet. This is space-time. And if you put stuff 
on that rubber sheet, a bowling ball, a softball, you're going to depress it. You're going to cause a warping in space defined by this rubber sheet. In three dimensions, it does the same thing. If I put a, a sun, a galaxy, a sphere of dark matter out there, it literally warps the space around it. Space is not just empty and nothing. And so that a massive object that's located between us on Earth and some distant source of light, it could be a galaxy, a quasar, is going to travel along in a, in, in a warped universe. And as it gets close to this, depending on how close it is, it's going to follow the, the shortest path it can, which is going to be a curved path, and the light will be deflected. So what Einstein was predicting, here on Earth, when there was an eclipse, the light from a distant star that normally might be obscured by the sun, this is an exaggerated angle of bending, but basically gets bent so that it looks to us as though it's over here. It's really here, it gets shifted out. And what they saw were about a dozen stars that when the sun wasn't in that part of the sky, you could look at that same set of stars, see where they were relative to other stars. And when the sun was there, they all moved out by exactly what Einstein was predicting. When you showed that blue, I'll use the term ether, but uh, you know. The dark matter? Yeah, yes. the dark matter. How did you even detect it? So the dark matter there uh, warps space. And what we're going to talk about next is how gravitational lensing. So there was a light behind that, lights of lots of galaxies. And as they travel through the universe, they get bent because you have that big blob of dark matter there. It acts like a lens, just like the lens that we're passing around does. So the light gets bent. And what you see is galaxies that, instead of looking like galaxies, get stretched and elongated into to arcs of light. And they get distorted in such a way that you can work backwards from all the distortions you see and reconstruct what had to be there, what kind of mass had to be there to warp space and produce the image you see. And I'm going to show you some of those images. How is the census of matter in the universe conducted? So it starts out, um, the first hint of dark matter starts with looking at how things move in space. So gravity is normally what keeps things moving around. You can actually weigh the sun by looking at how the planets move around the sun. And regular relativity, Newton's relativity, will tell you how massive the sun's gravity has to be to keep things moving in exactly that orbit. And when uh, astronomers first look at uh, Fritz Zwicky was one of the first to look at, at a cluster of galaxies. And what he saw was a bunch of galaxies all moving around each other in a cluster. So nothing in space is ever still. This is sort of, we look out at space and you see things there. They're all moving just on time scales that are too long for us to actually see. So if you look at a cluster of galaxies, which might be hundreds or a thousand galaxies, they're gravitationally bound and moving around one another. And what he saw was that they were moving at millions of miles of an hour, far too fast to stay gravitationally bound if what was holding them in place was all the matter in the galaxy. So you look at a galaxy, you can estimate how many stars are there from the starlight, you can estimate the masses that would be associated with that starlight, you add up all those masses, and what you see is uh, not nearly enough mass by a factor usually of 10 to hold them in place. So my politically incorrect analogy that I like to use is, you guys remember those merry-go-rounds that used to be at playgrounds before everything had to be super safe, right? So imagine you're looking at the playground, you're there, and you've got a bunch of four-year-olds on this merry-go-round. You know how, roughly how tightly they can hold on. Somebody's older brother is in one of those moods, runs over and starts whirling it around, and he starts pushing it faster and faster and faster and faster. What do you expect to see? Small bodies flying everywhere. It's probably not the best image. And as you're starting to run over, you notice this thing is whirling at incredible speeds, and those little kids aren't going anywhere. It's telling you something. I don't know, somebody glued their shoes to the platform, they're strapped in, something else is holding them there. And the only thing we know of in the universe that can really hold things in these different kinds of orbits and motions is gravity, and gravity means mass. So by looking at this, um, and then looking at stars moving around the center of a galaxy. So if you look at these beautiful spiral galaxies, the stars are all orbiting around the center. Again, they're moving far too fast. They should have been flung out of that galaxy millions of billions of years ago. They shouldn't be able to hold together in a coherent gravitationally bound system. So those were the first bits of evidence that started back in the 30s. It got confirmed more and more. But we can now look at things like the cosmic microwave background which is the light from the afterglow of the Big Bang. It's light that's traveled over the universe. And, and encoded in that light is a wealth of information about the, what the universe is, what it's made of. And it's, it's basically an image of this, think of this sort of roiling soup at the very early universe. You've got high energy particles crashing in and out of each other. It's almost the same everywhere, except a little bit more particles here, 100,000 and one here. 
999,999 over here, just little over densities. And those little over densities in this roiling soup are what eventually grow into the structures we see today. Because where there's a little bit more, gravity keeps pulling more in, the rich get richer. And so by looking at this microwave background, and, and we've been looking at it in higher and higher rev resolution, you can see that if there was more regular matter than we see in the universe today, you wouldn't, it, it won't make sense with those observations. So you're looking at things like clusters, you're looking at things, I've got some other really neat things because there is still a question, is it something about gravity that we don't understand? Right? So if gravity works the way we think it does, and we see these motions, it tells us there's more mass there. If on the other hand, maybe, maybe it's time to rewrite Einstein's theory. As you're looking out at the universe, the motions that you're seeing, the microwave background information that you're seeing, all of this combined with observations of clusters, of gravitational lensing, and the very structure in the universe itself, in order to form the galaxies and the things that we see, you use computer simulations, if you put a lot more normal matter in, it doesn't work. So we see a lot of matter, we know it can't be the regular stuff, and so it's gotta be this dark matter. I could spend all, yeah. Yep, I'm getting the high sign, so I, I'll, So, so I'll take just one second on it. So as we're looking out at the universe and we see things that don't make sense, if we understand gravity and we're looking at how stars rotate around the center of a galaxy or galaxies um, move around in a cluster of galaxies, either there's, if gravity works, there has to be more mass there than we can see. The other option is there's only the mass that we can see and somehow there's something about gravity that we don't understand and we need to rewrite gravity. So that's what we've been looking at over the last, um, I don't know, 100 years, 50 years, and trying to understand what the universe is made of. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Dr. Evelyn Gates discussing how gravitational lensing allows us to explore the properties of dark matter and dark energy. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Gates discusses the images of astronomical objects that gravitational lensing produces. Now, back to the talk. So let's jump back into Einstein. As he's thinking about gravitational lensing, in 1936, this is just another historical note, he redid all of his calculations that included saying if you had a, a star, something massive, it could deflect the light of a more distant star. And he wrote this in a note to Herr Mandel. He wrote a paper in 36 that was called Lens-like Action of a Star by Deviation of Light in the Gravitational Field, and all that meant is that a star could act as a gravitational lens. And you could lens one star by a closer star. You could get the double images that I hope you've all been able to see. You can get a ring of light. And he said, this is a most curious effect. Of course, there is no hope of observing this phenomenon directly. And there, Einstein was absolutely wrong in a really big way. He did not anticipate the advances in technology. And he only wrote this paper because Mr. Mandel was a, an engineer who was, I don't, had an office nearby Einstein or something and kept bugging him and saying, could you write it up, could you write it up? So he writes this, this groundbreaking paper mainly just to make somebody happy, which <laughs> is, is pretty impressive. He said a note to the editor saying, thank you for your cooperation with the little publication which Mr. Mandel squeezed out of me it is of little value, but it makes the poor guy happy. Not knowing that effectively this was launching an entire new way of looking at the universe, and in fact gravitational lensing, this ability of mass to warp space and create these lensing effects, is now the most powerful tool that we have in looking for the dark universe, and looking for dark matter and dark energy. And so what we're seeing is if light is coming from something distant and there's a massive object here, it gets deflected. And the amount of the deflection, the distortion, just depends on how massive that lens is, how close the light passes to where the lens actually is, and the distances involved. The wine glass is there to remind you at dinner tonight, pick up your wine glass while it's still empty, and you can do the lensing effect, and then you can impress your friends uh, later this weekend. Um, so here's what's happening. Here we are on Earth. We're looking at a bright object, let's say it's a distant galaxy in the universe, and there's a closer galaxy that's creating a massive warp in space, and it's there, if they are directly lined up, what we're going to see on Earth is this Einstein ring. 
the thing that I hope you've all seen. It's just light bending around because we've got curved space instead of curved glass, but the same thing. Now things aren't usually lined up, so if they're not perfectly lined up, what you see is the light, instead of getting a ring, you'll get two images of the same thing. And then the cool thing is, as you get more complicated uh, lenses, you can see even more incredible objects. But if you take something like a question mark and you put a black hole directly between us and the question mark, you'll get this Einstein ring. If you move it a little off to the side, you get two images, one inverted. And if you just barely sort of get to the point where you impact uh, and affect this question mark, it just gets stretched out and elongated a little bit. But there's some kind of warping. You've all had a chance to look through this lens. Uh, this is the coach of the Xavier basketball team with Dick Vitale. Uh, one of them's a family member, so he gets lensed. Um, and basically, you see something that doesn't look like what you expect it to look like. Um, if you're looking, uh, this is looking at the, uh, uh, one of the um, visitor centers at uh, Goddard. If you look down at that light, I'm going to put a black hole between us and that image of a galaxy at the end. Again, you create a ring of light, but if you'll notice, you also sort of push things out. It tends to magnify and move where you expect things to be. So we know this is, this is almost like optics. We can calculate what these lensing effects should look like. And Einstein was right that it was hard to observe this, but the first double quasar, two images of the same thing because of this lensing effect, was observed in 1979. And the first Einstein ring was actually observed um, about eight years later. So if you look out into space, this is what you see. These are eight images of different uh, spots in the sky. Let's take this one. And basically, this bright yellow um, white object is a galaxy. It's about 2 billion light years from Earth. The blue ring that you see around it is not a blue ring in space. It's another galaxy that's directly behind this galaxy. We shouldn't even be able to see it. it should, its light should be blocked. It's about another 2 billion light years behind, and what you see is this beautiful ring of light. If you stop and think about it, what you're seeing is general relativity actually etched on the sky. You shine a light through the universe, and all of a sudden you're seeing things that you could not see otherwise. You're seeing the very architecture of space itself. And these are just some more images of rings and, and sort of the arc-like structures you get taken from a ground-based telescope to show you it's not just the space-based. So the cool thing about gravitational lensing is it's not just a curious effect, as Einstein said. You can actually do things with it. So for example, we're looking for planets outside our own solar system. So far, we have 1,905 planets that have been confirmed as planets outside our solar system. There are another 3,700 that have been detected by the Kepler satellite, and probably about 90% of them will ultimately be confirmed as extrasolar planets. So think about it. 1990, we knew of nine planets in the entire universe. 2000 or so, we knew of eight planets in the entire universe. <laughs> and today, it's almost 2000 that we know of for sure. That's really amazing. And of those, 34 have been found through gravitational lensing. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how that works. You can weigh a cluster of galaxies. The lensing effects that you see depend on how much mass is there. So it allows you to weigh things that even if you can't see them, because all they have to do is warp space. And you shine a light through it, and there are lots of things in the distant universe that shine through. It magnifies things 20, 30 times over. So with this lensing, I'm seeing more and more papers, more and more images on the Hubble Space Telescope site that say, we've used this new tool, gravitational lensing, to see the most distant galaxy ever found. Normally, it would be invisible even to the Hubble Space Telescope, but it's been magnified by a lens made out of space itself. We can test different theories of gravity that we just talked about. We can map the dark matter in the universe, and we can find the imprint on that web of dark energy. This is one of the most exciting ways that we can hope to see in effect, the um, dark universe. So looking for extrasolar planets, this is an image of our own galaxy. We're sitting out here, and we're going to look at um, planets or stars in close to the center. And between those stars and us, those stars are shining their light through a whole lot of other stars. And some of those stars will have planets on it, or planets around them. So if a star like the sun makes a warp in space, the planet going around that sun, that star, will make a tinier little warp, a little dimple. 
kind of like the lump on the log on the frog at the bottom of the sea kind of thing. So basically what we're going to look for is some kind of lensing effect where we see this dimple in, in uh, space time caused by a planet. The cool thing is you don't even have to see the star that it's orbiting around. Most of those nearly 2,000 planets that have been found have been found by looking at uh, analyzing their star's light. But for 34 of them, we've been able to look at things um, like this. So basically, you've got here we are on Earth. Here's a distant star. We're coming along. Ignore the word macho. Just think of that as a planet. And it's passing along our line of sight because it's orbiting around its star. And as it passes by, it lenses this distant star. So you get two images, but they're too close together to see two images. You see a brighter star. So as you're looking at a distant star, you see it get brighter and dimmer again. So this is looking at the star's light in a distant star. You see it get brighter and dimmer again. So that's if there's a star that passes in front of it. Now, if you have a planet around that star, what you see is here's the star getting, the, the distant star's light getting brighter because of the lens, the star passing in front of it. And if there's a planet, you see it get brighter and you get this little blip that says a planet just passed there. The little warp in space time actually allows you to see the star gets brighter, it gets dimmer, and then all of a sudden a little bright spot that tells you that a planet has just uh, passed by. And here's data that actually show you, just to convince you, monitoring the light of a star, and you see it get brighter and dimmer, and then you see this little blip that tells you that there's been a planet there. The neat thing about this is most of the, the, the planets we found outside our solar system have to be relatively close because we have to be able to see the star's light. With this technology, you don't need the star's light. And in fact, we've been able to find uh, one of the most distant planets ever found that was 21,500 light years away. Most of them are under 1,000 light years away. So this really extends your reach. And once you can extend your reach, you can do a survey. And by looking at a lot of stars and looking at their light and how they get brighter and dimmer, astronomers, this is back in 2012, wrote a paper that, that um, estimated that there's at least one planet for every star in the galaxy. So there are roughly 100, 300 billion stars in the galaxy. There are hundreds of billions of planets out there, which really changes, again, our impression of the cosmos and where we fit within this bigger picture. Um, we can map out where the dark matter is. So what happens? This is a cluster of galaxies, bright yellow, bright yellow, bright yellow, bright yellow. These are hundreds of galaxies that are all sort of moving around each other in, a, in a, what's called a cluster. And this long, stretched out pinkish thing here, which is originally called a dragon, isn't a long, stretched out pinkish thing in space. It's a single, distant galaxy, billions of years, light years further away from us than this cluster, whose light has been, um, there's several images encoded within this one long stretched out thing, but it's stretched out and multiply imaged. You get these weird, weird funky effects, just like looking at your neighbor through the lens. And so here's how you use it. Here is an example of a cluster of galaxies. And if you see this weird blue figure eight here and here and here, and there's one in the center there, those are multiple copies of the same distant galaxy. So far back in the universe is that blue figure eight-ish thing. There's a cluster here. The light from this thing shines through here and gets split into multiple images. So they've been circled here. So you can see image here, 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 and one in the center. Now the neat thing is, because you're seeing these multiple images, what you have with the cluster of galaxies is it's got, again, a big blob of dark matter around it. And then you've got the, the matter and the dark matter in each one of the individual galaxies. So instead of a simple lens like the one I've passed around, you've got one big lens and then lots of little ones on, that are sort of in, t in front of it. So if you ever look through those lenses that sort of um, say they're like a, an insect eye where you see all these weird, funky optical illusions, that's what we're looking through. But it's space now that's, that's warped in this really weird way. But by looking at where the images are, how many there are, and there are actually a lot more multiple images and lensing in here, the more they study it, the more they find, you can turn it backwards and say, how is the matter distributed? So what you're seeing here is the first map of dark matter that was ever made. And this is one direction on the sky. This is another direction. And the, the, more, the higher this peak, the more mass there is in that space, point in space. So we didn't see any of this stuff. But what you're seeing is a mountain of mass that represents the dark matter in that cluster of galaxies. And then uh, I think about 119 individual peaks that correspond to the individual galaxies. And you can actually work backwards and say, if we could see the dark matter 
in that cluster of galaxies. It would be a blob and you know, hot, these dense points uh, wherever the galaxies are, but it, for the most part, it's a giant spherical almost blob of dark matter. There's some other cool things. I might have time again for the... Um, here's, a, here's another cluster of galaxies, and this is the brightest galaxy in the cluster. And you see these things that have diffraction spikes. Sometimes that it means it's a point source of light, like a star in our own galaxy, or a quasar, a distant black hole that's giving off a lot of energy. And you see five images here that are actually um, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and Q5 in the center. They're five images of exactly the same object. And there are other things that are circled because you have multiple images of galaxy A and galaxy B. But this quasar is really cool because Einstein's theory messes not just with space but with time. So a quasar is a black hole that's devouring things in the early universe, giving off a lot of light and energy. And its light is variable. You'll see it get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. There's a kind of pattern to it. It's an erratic pattern, but you can actually trace it out. And what you see when you look at these images of light is that you see this pattern in Q1. 400 days later, that same pattern pops up in Q2. A couple years later, it's in Q3, a few months after that, Q4. And basically what's happening is the light from that distant quasar, from one thing, is traveling through different paths in space that are different lengths. So light travels at a certain speed, but it's also passing through the, the cluster, and gravity also changes the way things, the way light moves near it. So you've got these competing effects, and what happens is you can actually see the time effects. And it's almost thinking of a song with a phrase, and you hear that phrase first in Q1, you hear it a little bit later in Q2, and then years later in Q3. And that, again, tells you even more about what the mass distribution is in this cluster of galaxies. Yeah, you've mentioned uh, mass uh, a number of times. In our conventional universe, the 5% part that you showed in your circle, we measure mass on the periodic table. We have methods for doing that. Everybody understands it. Um, what happens to our concepts of mass uh, with dark matter? What would be the atomic number of uh, dark matter, or would it have one? That's a really good question. It would not have an atomic number. So if dark matter is is composed of exotic particles, new particles that haven't been detected, which seems we haven't found them yet, so I can't say for sure. It seems to me to be a reasonable um, solution. Um, we know in particle physics that there's more than the particles that we see and know of. There's some questions that we have. So a new sector with new particles. People have looked to see whether these particles could themselves form atoms or bound states. We don't know enough about it to know exactly how this would work, but there has been some people who have followed that line of questioning. But they wouldn't appear on our periodic table at all because they're made of different things. If you take any element on the periodic table, you can break it down into a nucleus and the electrons that go around it. You could look at the nucleus and find the neutrons and the protons in it. You can break those neutrons and protons down into quarks. You can get down to the basic constitu constituents. Dark matter is something entirely different not made of quarks or anything else. The uh, three-dimensional chart of the mass and that cluster that you showed, I, it, it, to me it implied, but correct me if I'm wrong, is the dark matter distributed proportionally to the matter that we're familiar with in all cases, to the best of our knowledge? So, the, so a better way to think about it is that the matter that we're familiar with is distributed to where the dark matter is the densest. So because dark matter is the bulk of everything, it, it collects and forms this strong gravitational pull. The normal matter that we know of that's also out there falls into that gravitational pull of where there's a big chunk of dark matter. So you'll find uh, a cluster of galaxies at a, at, a, at a point in space where there's also a lot of dark matter, where the dark matter web is especially dense. So it's, you, you've got the right idea. But we've got to take ourselves out of the center and, and come back. Dark matter is what's driving things, and we're just falling in sort of afterwards. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that um, we were seeing the images because of gravitational lenses uh, that gave you the idea of where the dark matter was. Are there anything, is there anything other than that that also supports the existence of dark matter, other than the gravitational lensing. The gravitational lensing, the motion of stars around a galaxy, the, the center of a galaxy, the motion of clusters in a cluster of galaxies, 
The microwave background that I mentioned also um, indicates very strongly that most of the matter in the universe has to be in dark matter, something that's not normal matter. Um, so, and, and this is the important thing, it's not one observation or even one kind of observation. And, and for a long time, there, was, there were a group of scientists who said, we're, we're looking at what's happening in stars, uh, rotating around a galaxy. And the question is, if that's the only evidence for dark matter, you know, the stars are moving too fast, there are other solutions that maybe we could, we could look at. And what's happened is we've looked at the universe in more wavelengths of light, in more distances. We've um, understood more about how the universe has evolved from the microwave background, where we can sort of see where the seeds of galaxies are and see how they have to develop to form the universe that we see today. So you've got the starting point and the end point. To get those two to meet up, you have to have a lot of dark matter in the universe. So, to me, what's exciting is it's, it's not just one thing, but it's all these different ways that tell you that there has to be dark matter out there. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Evelyn Gates. Dr. Gates received her PhD in physics from Case Western Reserve University. In the second part of our talk, we learned about how gravitational lensing has been used to discover planets around distant stars. In our final segment, Dr. Gates will discuss how gravitational lensing provides evidence for the existence of dark matter. Now, back to our talk. I had to show you this one. This one came out fairly recently. So this is really cool. What you're looking at again is a cluster of galaxies. The bright white yellow things are all galaxies that are in this group of a hundred or thousands of galaxies. And then what you see here is this strange little blue sort of stretched out galaxy. And there's another image of it. I've got to move over here a little bit up around in this corner. And there's another one in here. So this blue thing, this blue spidery looking spiral arm thing is not in the cluster of galaxies. It's billions of light years behind it. And as its light's been coming through this galaxy, the galaxy itself has been split into at least these three images. There's an image here, there's one up here, and there's some bits of things within here as well. And the neat thing is they'd seen this for a while. They knew that this cluster was a great gravitational lens, a lot of mass there. It was causing a lot of really neat uh, effects. But what you're seeing in this image is these little bright yellow points of light, and there's a faint one over here. That's a supernova. That's a star that exploded in this blue galaxy billions of light years behind it. There's only one supernova. So not only did you multiply image this galaxy, but you got multiple images because it split as it got very close to this galaxy in the cluster. You get multiple images of the supernova and it went off at different times. So they looked at, I've seen images of this galaxy before there were any yellow dots there. There was no supernova. And when they looked at it, they just got one image, and they could see this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. You're seeing boom, 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 boom. It's the same thing, but you're just seeing it as it's lens. It's arriving at different times. Now, the other cool thing is it happened before. So about 20 years ago, because we understand enough about how matter is distributed in this lens, we know that it went off in this galaxy over here. I think I hope I've got that one right, 20 years ago. We didn't see it, we weren't looking for it. But it's gonna happen again. That same supernova, which only exploded one time, that's an exploding star, we're gonna see it again. This wonderful time delay allows us to look in here and they expect to see it in early 2016. So they're gonna keep an eye on this thing to see it go off again. So not only are we sort of seeing Einstein's theory and sort of all these strange images, but we're actually almost kind of hearing it as these things take off and, and, and time itself is impacted. So let me jump into a little bit the last topic on modified gravity versus dark matter. What do we know about dark matter and how it self interacts? So you've probably heard through these series about the super collider over at CERN. Particle physicists love to smash things together to see what comes out. You take two particles at super high speed energies and you just crash them together and see what comes out. Astronomers don't have that luxury. They can't take two galaxies or two clusters and crash them together. You have to wait and see if you can catch one in the act. And they have. And this was the first one, but there are several of them there. So there was something called the bullet cluster that had a unique shape to it, which is actually two clusters that are in the process of colliding into one another. They collided about 100 million years ago. The centers of these clusters are now a little over 2 million light years apart, and they're moving at incredible speeds. 
So when we look at the clusters in optical, you take Hubble Space Telescope and look out, and here's the central galaxy in this cluster over here, and here are the galaxies in this cluster over here. So this one was coming from this direction, and this one came over to this direction, and they, shoom, they, they collided. Now when a cluster of galaxies collides, there are three components actually within a cluster. There are galaxies that you see, there's the dark matter that I talked about, and there's a, a, a thin uh, haze of gas that goes around all of the galaxies. There's some that's made of normal matter. So you've got normal matter gas, you've got galaxies, and you've got dark matter. If dark matter is there, and our understanding of gravity is correct, at least as far as this is concerned, most of the mass in this galaxy is in dark matter, about 85%. Most of the normal matter is in the form of this gas that surrounds the galaxies, and the galaxies are just a small percent of the overall cluster. What happens when you take a big blob of dark matter gas and galaxies here and a big blob of dark matter gas and galaxies here and you crash them together? Galaxies are so far apart, they ba basically just pass through one another. They go right on through. Gas, on the other hand, when you take a ball of gas and another ball of gas and you crash it into each other, they're shock heating. You know, the gas interacts, and that interaction, anytime you have an interaction, it slows things down. So as these things crash together, you get the galaxies going on through, you get the gas coming and interacting and slowing down. So it's a way of separating the components. What about the dark matter? Dark matter, our best um, understanding of it, is it probably doesn't interact, it doesn't interact at all with the gas, and probably doesn't interact with itself much at all either, but that's something we'd like to find out. So you take these things and you watch if there's dark matter, and if it moves through each, you know, doesn't interact very strongly, you expect it to just go back, go on through, and so the galaxies and the dark matter should be about the same place in space, and having left the gas behind a little bit. So let's take another look. Let's look in X-ray, which tell us that shows where the centers of the galaxies are. Let's look in X-ray. So if you look in X-ray light from the Chandra telescope, this is what you see, and this is why it was called the bullet cluster, because this cloud of gas, which has just come through this one, is got a bow shock. It sort of looks like a bullet passing through. So here are the galaxies over here, over here, and here are the two clouds of gas, just as you expect. They didn't make it as far as the galaxies did. This is probably a first pass through. And so they've lagged behind us, we would expect. OK, what about the dark matter? So if there is no dark matter, most of the mass in these clusters is going to be in this gas, not in the galaxies. So if we had a way to map out to see where the mass is, we should see it centered on these clouds of gas. If there's dark matter, however, we expect to see it superimposed over where these galaxies are. Do we have a way of mapping out where that matter is? Yes. We can use gravitational lensing and looking at the distortions, and they're very subtle distortions of all these more distant galaxies, allows us to recreate the lens just like we made that mass map. And when we do that, this is what we see. The blue is the dark matter, just like that, that blob I showed you in the first one. And the dark matter is squarely on top of where the galaxies are and not on top of where the gas is behind. So we've separated the components, and the bulk of the mass in these clusters after this first collision is over here, and it's exactly where and what you would expect if about 85% of that mass is in dark matter. It's really kind of cool. Crash things together and see what comes out. Now, if we look out at the universe since then, since those discoveries, we have several other cases of where galaxy clusters have crashed into one another. They're at different points. They're in their collision. They may have passed through once or twice again. But basically, not only do they all show these same effects, you're separating it out, and the mass is not where the gas is. There's a whole lot more mass there that's not in gas and galaxies. But furthermore, it allows us to put some constraints on how strongly dark matter interacts with itself. So we can't detect the particles yet, but we already know something from Einstein's telescope about how they interact. I'm um, going to briefly touch on dark energy um, before we end. So a few years ago, there was a Nobel Prize given for the discovery that the universe is accelerating. The universe itself is expanding. It has been since the Big Bang, expanding and cooling. And what we expected to see um, is if we looked out and tried to see how this expansion was changing, it should be slowing down. It should be slowing down for the same reason that when you take a ball and you throw it up into the air, what's going to happen? It goes up, it slows down, it stops and comes back down again, right? Gravity is pulling it back down. What if I've got you know, a few steroids going and I can throw it with superhuman strength 
and I throw it faster than the escape velocity. As it goes up, what happens? It still slows down until it gets out, right? So we expected the universe, which is expanding. You know, space itself is increasing, but there's stuff in the universe. We can see galaxies, never mind the dark matter, there's stuff. And all that stuff is attracted to all the other stuff and should be trying to slow down the expansion of the universe. So it's expanding out. The gravitational pull of all the stuff in it wants to pull it back down. So we expected if we looked out at the history of the expansion of the universe, it should slow down. And what we saw in the late 1990s was exactly the opposite. The universe, and we've now traced it closely enough, we see the universe expanding, it slowed down, and then all of a sudden it turned around and sped up. So that's like you take that baseball, you throw it up, you see it slow down, you're getting ready to catch it, and all of a sudden, phew, it just zooms out of sight. And you'd be like, wait a minute, what happened? What kind of ball was that? What, you know, what fueled that, that, that zip out? And that's exactly how the physics community reacted when we got this news. The universe is expanding. It's suddenly zipping away. It's, it's, it's increasing acceleration. And it implies that maybe there's some new substance in the universe, some cosmic accelerant that's fueling this expansion. And if you go back to Einstein's equation, that first equation I showed you, you can put something into that equation that will, will cause the universe not just to expand, but to accelerate. It's really weird stuff. If it's there, it's dominating the universe. It's fueling this accelerated expansion of space. And it tells us that gravity is no longer in charge of the ultimate fate of the universe. Gravity cannot slow the universe down and either just keep slowing down or return to a big crunch. It's speeding up because of this dark energy. The other alternative is that there's something now, again, about um, general relativity, about gravity that we don't understand. So what is this dark energy? What could there be for a cosmic accelerant? The answer is we don't know. And the really exciting part for a scientist is we don't even have any really good ideas in a sense. Lots and lots of ideas, lots of things that we're exploring, um, some crazier than others. But there's nothing that's emerged as the really best candidate that really seems to work the way a new particle works for dark matter. That's pretty straightforward by comparison with dark energy. It could be energy of empty space. It could be some new energy field that, in a weird way, fills all of space. It could be a new theory of gravity, something even stranger involving extra dimensions. Um, but whatever it is, and this is the key thing, it's got to be totally new physics. There is no way dark energy can be explained by something as simple as a new particle. It's something that's going to change sort of our understanding of the universe at the same level that the changes that we saw with, with uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, and it's going to lead to some radical new understanding of the universe in which we live, which makes it pretty compelling to go out and figure out what this stuff is. And so there's been a lot of work by both theorists and, and experimentalists and observers. And the cool thing about dark energy, it has two effects on the universe. So as the expansion, as it expands, it increases the distance to a given object that we can see. We can measure how fast something is moving, a redshift, and, and the distance is going to change. It also changes how things in the universe grow, how things clump to form galaxies and clusters of galaxies and the web of dark matter that I will show you in a minute. And gravitational lensing is sensitive both to how much distance there is between objects and how much mass is there, how much things have clumped, which is what will be uh, changed if dark energy is there. So dark energy is going to leave its imprint on what we call the cosmic web of dark matter. So if you could see on very large scales with dark matter eyes, if you could see what the universe would look like, this is what it looks like. This is a computer simulation. We don't yet have a map of this. But there's this giant web of matter that fills space. And at the places where it's densest, like this knot, which doesn't mean it's bright because there's light stuff there, but that's also where we would probably find a cluster of galaxies. Isn't it beautiful? <coughs> just this giant web. This is what the universe that we live in looks like. And it's evolved along with the universe. So it started out at this very homogeneous um, you know, cloud that stretched across space. And after a few hundred million years, it got denser. Gravity was tightening the strands of this web so that by today, we have a web that looks more or less like this. And what we want to do is go out and, and detect this web. We want to find it and map up not just what it looks like today, but how it, that exactly how it's evolved over time. And that will tell us whether dark energy is a good solution as something that's filling the universe, or whether there's something about gravity that we don't understand. And I just wanted to, to show you this picture of sort of mapping out 
part of that dark matter web. So there's a galaxy cluster up here. There's another one down here. There didn't appear to be anything. But using gravitational lensing, looking at the effects from distant light shining through the universe and allowing us to map out this thread is the beginning of that web of matter. And so there are a lot of telescopes out there today that are looking to, to measure at higher and higher precision so that we can actually see what the universe looks like and from that learn a little bit more about what dark matter is made of. So I'm just going to end with this image, which is, again, looking at a couple of galaxies out in space. I think it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. And the one thing is, as a scientist you never, learn, you never lose is that appreciation for the sheer grandeur, the gorgeousness of these images. And at the same time, when I look at them, I'm thinking about all the things in that image that I don't really see and the things that we're trying to find, the dark matter that surrounds these galaxies, the web, the, the web of matter in which they're embedded, and the dark energy which fills probably the entire universe and is going to keep us busy for the next several decades, most likely. Thank you. This lecture is part of the Origins Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. It has been brought to you with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, and MediaVision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.